Uh, I want you to know we're thrilled to have you joining the program, and I hope today is uh, helpful and uh, also a lot of fun for you. If you have any questions uh, after today, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. My office uh, is in the little Cogsite cluster, you may have heard about, in the F wing uh, in the part of the University College called the Cloisters. Uh, there's a lot of construction going on in UC right now, but all you need to know is this. There's the quad, and then there's the west side of the quad with the porch and a bunch of doors with letters on them. Just enter the F door, go on up to the second and third floor, and that's where you're, where, where, pardon me, you'll we'll find most of the consign books. So as Anna said, my name is Jim. I am an assistant professor in the teaching stream in the philosophy department. So what that means is that I'm a philosopher, and I'm going to say a bit about what that's all about, uh, and how a philosopher comes to be in a kind of side program in just a minute. What does it mean to say that I'm in the teaching stream, aside from, well, meaning that I teach a lot? Um, it means that part of what I do, uh, research-wise, is think about pedagogy. Think about what it is to teach and learn at a university level. And in fact, I've just begun a research project on the cognitive science of higher education. Uh, that's a topic I'm really interested in, very excited about. Um, and if any of you are interested in that, I know that some of you are planning on a career in education, at least you're thinking about that, I'd be happy to chat about it anytime. Uh, you know where to find me now. The F, F door. Um, so what I want to do in these brief remarks is just uh, say a bit about what philosophy is and how philosophy fits into uh, cognitive science as a field and the cognitive science program here at U of T. Uh, I won't talk too much. We're coming up on lunchtime. I'm sure folks are hot and also uh, hungry, a little tired. Um, so I'll make my, you know, theoretical stuff, I'll keep that, keep that short, and I'll try to stop early after 15 minutes or so, and uh, say just a bit about the courses that I typically teach, and take questions from you. Uh, maybe you've got questions about what I do with my role in the program. Okay, so, um, yeah, so philosophy in cognitive science. Well, look, let me start by saying something brief about what philosophy is. I mean, I'm sure you've all heard about philosophy. Maybe when you heard that Jim John was a philosopher, you expected some you know, elderly person with a long beard, perhaps a toga, to come in. I'm not sure. Here's the dark secret. Philosophers themselves do not agree on what philosophy is. Right? Ask 10 philosophers what in the world they do, you'll get 10 different answers. So what I'm about to say is very controversial. I have colleagues here that might not agree with all of this. Maybe you won't agree with all of it. Nevertheless, I think what I'm about to say is fairly plausible. You ready for this? It's coming. Look out. <laughs> You're ready. Brace. What philosophers do is try to uh, clarify, understand, and maybe, maybe, knock on wood, touch metal, maybe try to answer important questions that cannot be settled using empirical scientific methods. Now, an example of an important question, right? Is there a cure for cancer? That, we tend to think, is not philosophical. Why? Well, it's an important question. It's a big deal. A matter of enduring, burning human interest, whether there's a cure for cancer. But I reckon the scientists are the folks to talk to if you want to know exactly what that question means and how to answer it. Surely, it may not come tomorrow or the day after, but surely, empirical scientific methods are going to hook us up with an answer to the question, is there a cure for cancer, right? Here's a different question. Is there a God? But that is also an important question. Again, a matter of burning significance to many, many people. A question whose answer is going to ramify and have implications for all sorts of other questions you might want to ask. But here's the deal. This one, unlike the cancer question, is philosophical because there is no experiment, there's no possible experiment that will enable us to answer the question whether God exists. You've got to do something else to get clear on what that question means and on what plausible answers to it might be. What is that something else? Well, to relieve all the vulgar suspense, that something else is thinking real hard. <laughs> so, 
I have colleagues in the cognitive science program who have laboratories and staffs. So they've got people working for them night and day. They're wearing like white lab coats. There's rats. There's computer bags. I've got a real comfortable chair and some sharp and number two pencils. <laughs> uh, now, that's not the truth. I also have a laptop. <laughs> and a coffee mug and a couple of other things. But my point is this. What philosophers try to do is clarify these questions that really seem to matter, right? But that we just can't figure out how to handle scientifically, empirically. What do these questions mean? Maybe some of them are just nonsense, right? Good. That's progress. We'll get rid of those and we'll come by a set of questions that you know, we can really sink our teeth into. And then let's try thinking as hard as we can, informing ourselves of any bits of science and whatever human experience might be relevant. Let's see if we can't work our way somehow to a reasoned, plausible answer to it. Now, there's a ton more to say about that. But for now, I think that's good enough for us to get along with. What philosophers, whatever their interests might be, particular interests, I mean, ethics, God, right? Uh, what can we know, mind and body? Whatever a philosopher's more particular interests happen to be, what she's doing as a philosopher is trying to understand and maybe, maybe answer important, cool questions that we just can't get a scientific grip on. At least not now. It has happened in the history of ideas that questions that we thought were going to be purely uh, for the philosophers to think about, some conceptual breakthrough showed us how you could actually use science to deal with it. Right? And that's a cool thing. In some ways, that is happening with the mind. All right, so that's just a bit about what philosophy is. Now, how does philosophy fit into Kagsai, and how do I fit into the Kagsai program? And, you know, perhaps most pertinent for you, uh, how does what I'm all about fit into courses that you uh, may, may very well be willing to take? Okay? Well, uh, my interests in philosophy are largely in a branch of the field called the philosophy of mind. So I really like to think about hard, important questions, conceptual, theoretical, philosophical questions about minds, human minds, maybe artificial minds, and how these things relate to uh, physical bodies, like my body, or your body, or maybe the artificial body of some uh, future intelligent robot. Who knows? Okay? So that's the philosophy of mind. Now, uh, my interests within the philosophy of mind are pretty wide-ranging. But an important bunch of them, right, an important bunch of them have to do with some of the philosophical issues that are kind of thrown up by work done by cognitive psychologists, right, theoretical and cognitive linguists, people who do artificial intelligence and robotics, right, um, and part of the side, I left out some of the cognitive, cognitive anthropology, right? Um, you get the idea. So some of my uh, concerns in the philosophy of mind have to do with big picture questions about mind and body that might not necessarily come up in a cognitive class, but a good bunch of them have to do with philosophical questions that arise in the very course of doing, say, AI or robotics or the cognitive psychology of vision, for example. Okay? So that's where philosophy of mind comes into cognitive science, right? And that's how I come into this program. I really like to think about and introduce students to and get them excited about, right, the theoretical conceptual problems that arise uh, as linguists, say, or computer scientists, or psychologists, or neuroscientists do their uh, uh, empirical, purely scientific work. Now let me give you some examples. This is all big picture, and philosophers sometimes um, can be a bit too abstract in the picture. Let me bring this down and give you some examples. I jotted some down. Um, I'm going to give you examples of three ways in which, really, three places or sites or locations in which philosophy comes into the cognitive sciences right, and can be of real use, I hope, I think. Um, and let me know if I'm messing up on time. So the first place where uh, a cognitive science team might want to have a philosopher around has to do with puzzles, theoretical problems, conceptual confusions and difficulties that arise purely from empirical work in the field. Sometimes cognitive scientists are getting along with their science, and suddenly they realize, wait a minute, we're faced with a question that stumps us. 
And the right way to answer it doesn't seem to have anything to do with, you know, buying more equipment or hiring more lab assistants. This seems like a conceptual, a philosophical problem. We need to get a philosopher in here. Jim John around. <laughs> uh, here's an example. I teach a course in the program. It's one of our capstone seminars. It's one of the, it's not the only one, one of the uh, 400 level uh, senior seminars. They're terrific, uh, high level, very interdisciplinary um, cognitive courses. Mine is one of the 401 courses. It's the seminar for arts majors, uh, science majors are welcome too. Um, and I typically do it on consciousness, on the cognitive science of consciousness. Right? Each and every one of you is having some kind of conscious experience of me right now. Maybe you see me, maybe you hear me. Right? Uh, well, look, there are many researchers in the cognitive science of consciousness who think that the right way to dive in and try to give a scientific story about what consciousness is is to start by looking for what people sometimes call the neural correlate of consciousness. Now, basically, the idea is simple. Right? These researchers think, you know what? We'd be a lot farther along figuring out what the world of consciousness is if we could isolate the minimal part of brain activity such that if you stimulate a brain so that it activates in that way, you get a specific kind of conscious experience. And with the rise over the last 20, 30 years of sophisticated imaging technology, think in particular the use of functional magnetic resonance imaging, with the rise of sophisticated imaging technology, uh, we've had a lot of luck at seeing, to put it crudely, which parts of the brain light up when subjects in test conditions say they're having which kinds of conscious experiences. For example, we tend to think that a certain kind of electrochemical activity at the back of the brain has something important to do with, say, conscious visual experience. Okay? But here's the deal. One problem that uh, researchers in this area notice straight away is conceptual, theoretical. The worry is this. Suppose you run a bunch of test subjects through your, uh, uh, your scanner, and you find that um, there are portions of the brain that activate whenever these subjects say they're having conscious experiences of red. Very simplified example, but the, the details and all the peculiarities and particularities will matter. You run all these test subjects through it, it looks like, man, the same parts of the brain light up whenever these folks say they're having a, uh, a, a red visual experience. Right? You stimulate their brain, they have a wash of red filled with visual field. So maybe we found the neural correlate of conscious experience. Wow. But then you think, well, wait a minute, maybe. But how do we know that we haven't just found the neural correlate of being able to verbally report having a uh, conscious experience of red? Or how do we know we haven't found the correlate of having a conscious experience of red and being able to verbally report it, right? Now, another question along those same lines goes like this. Maybe you set your experiment up so that each and every one of those subjects you ran through had to focus on something. So then the worry is, well look, maybe what we found is the neural correlate of having a conscious experience of red. But maybe what we found is just the correlate of being able to focus on or visually attend to a stimulus that you're presented with, right? I might say, quick, everybody, look at this shirt. You're having a red experience, right? <laughs> um, there's some visual attention on your part, right? Uh, or maybe what we found is the neural correlate of having an experience of red and being able to attend to it. So what we need is a way to devise an experiment or do something so that we can say in a principled, plausible way which parts of that brain activation we observe, we really did observe it, right, is somehow responsible for and subserving, maybe identical with, the reddish part and which parts have to do instead with the ability to attend, to focus, or to report and talk about what you have seen and focused on. You see that? So what philosophers have been very uh, helpful with is coming in and helping to devise new experimental protocols and thinking through what all the possible possibilities are here. Um, and in fact, there is a lively debate, very interdisciplinary, 
It involves cognitive psychologists, uh, neuroscientists, philosophers of mind, and yet others, uh, folks in computer vision, um, in, in AI and computer science. There's a lively debate on how in the world to conduct properly, right? Uh, research into possible neural correlates, the brain basis um, of conscious experience. Now, there's a ton more to say about that. That's just one example. Another way in which philosophy can come into cognizance has to do with puzzles and theoretical problems that come not from any one scientific program, like neuroscience and consciousness, right? But rather from the attempt to put it all together. So Anna said a moment ago something that was really good. She said, we asked the students, they said, said, what do you love about the program? Cogsci students said, we love the interdisciplinarity. Then we asked the students, what do you not like so much about the program? The students said, the interdisciplinarity, right? Here's the thing, you're going to take a lot of different courses. You're going to take philosophy courses, you're going to take computer science courses, you're going to take linguistics courses, psychology, you're going to take other courses besides. And you might come away from all of these thinking, I took all these courses that all satisfy my cog. But at the end of that, what did they really have to do with each other? I mean, I took this computer science course that was about machine learning, and I learned all these algorithms and how to deal with them. Then I took this class in theoretical linguistics, and it was all about trees and syntax and WH movement. Then I took this Jim John class, and who knows what was up with that? He had a red shirt on, though. You know, I, I just don't, I don't see what do these disparate, what do they all have to do with each other? Well, the question then is, what unified, integrated vision of the mind, right? Again, human minds, non-human animal minds, artificial machine minds. What integrated, unified, coherent picture, if any, of the mind emerges from all this interdisciplinary work? The philosophers are very useful there at getting these folks to talk to each other. And I hope, I'm still working on it, that my course, especially the 300 level courses that I teach, go somewhere to, towards uh, doing this. One more uh, source of puzzles, and then I'll open it up and see if you have questions. Um, finally, big picture questions. Questions about the very nature of mentality itself. You might have all heard about the fabled mind-body problem, right? Um, in the course of thinking about what mind and mentality are in your cognizant courses, will you ever need to assume that there's some element to mentality that goes beyond, for example, um, what you might learn about in a physics or chemistry course. Many of you, I'm sure, think that having a mind has something to do with having a brain, a body, situated in a, in, a, in a natural environment in a certain way. Well, could it be that there's something more required, something that the natural sciences just can't get a grip on? It turns out, and we touch on these in some of the courses that we teach here, there are very interesting, surprisingly powerful arguments for thinking that perhaps the natural sciences, as we understand them, can't entirely accommodate the mind as we discover it when we really think hard about what it is. Obviously, this is a place where philosophers can be useful, and it's a place where I hope I can be useful to you in the courses I teach. Um, I'm told I'm just about out of time. If you have any questions for me or Anna, let's do this. Uh, I'll be here for the, the beginning, but then I have to go. I have another orientation thing I have to go to. So maybe we can move on and you can... Well, if anybody has a pressing question, you can have another group of pressing questions. Right. Otherwise, 